it's almost the case actually that if you want to do anything sensible, you more or less have to do the opposite of what the government recommends. And that's particularly true in food and agriculture. There hasn't been anybody, to my knowledge, in a real position of power in food and agriculture in Britain, in my, in my memory, not the least for 30 years. Secretary of State for Agriculture, or for EDEF, or as it's called now, Environment and Food and Agriculture, ought to be one of the most important things, because agriculture is a thing you absolutely have to get right. And in fact, governments regard it more or less with contempt. They regard it as a bore. And they put in people who are either sort of on the way out, who they don't know what to do with, like Margaret Beckett, or they put in people who are on the way up, but they don't quite know, you know what to do with them for that week. So at one point we have David Miliband, as, and he was quite good for a fortnight, and then of course he went on to hire these and so on. And that's the way they treat agriculture. And the moment we have a, a bloke, as you probably know, called Owen Patterson, I read an article the other day, I'll just tell you because I think it's funny. I read an article the other day in the London Review of Books, which wasn't about Patterson, it was about Ian Duncan Smith. And it said the point about Ian Duncan Smith is that he, that he is unemployable. The only job he could possibly do is, is that of being a Secretary of State, because that doesn't require any qualifications or any particular skills. And this applies to Owen Patterson in spades. It is unbelievable the kind of policies that he, he introduces. Just a, a small one off the top of the head, I'm already wandering from the script, but just a small one off the top of the head, is that it is part of the tradition of a, a great, great, great deal of um, traditional agriculture around the world, the ancient stuff, that you don't actually cut down trees on the tops of hills. And the reason you don't do that is very obvious, that it stops the water just rushing away and it just contains the water. The other day, there was Patterson recommending, recommending to uh, uh, what you call Welsh farmers that they should cut down the last of the trees on the hills, so that um, they, because you get a bigger grant for having pasture land than you do for having trees. I mean, that is the kind of mentality that drives British agriculture. You look around at the floods. I don't know how badly you've suffered from the floods down here, but you look around at the floods. And you can say, uh, it's impossible to judge exactly how much, but you want to say at least 50% of this is due to bad management of water. At least 50%. At least 50% of that is due to badly designed agriculture, which never had either drought or flood in its head at all. I mean, the, the disconnect between what needs to be done and what is done in this area is fantastic, quite honestly. If you look at food policy as a whole, around the whole world, you find, as everybody knows, I'm sure these days, that out of a world population of 7 billion, 1 billion, according to the United Nations, are estimated to be chronically undernourished. And of course, in this country, which is a rich country, I think it's still the seventh biggest economy in the world, isn't it? Something like that. Uh, um, we're rich here, we're doing well. Everyone, Chancellors of the Exchequer have been telling us for years how well we've been doing, thanks to their ingenuity. But as you know, people, there are loads of people in this country who can't afford good food, and there are loads of people, even Oxfordshire, which is not the poor end of the, of the market, who are dependent on food banks. And that is just unbelievable. And I haven't been to a food bank, I'm ashamed to say, and I admire the people that run them, but I have seen them on the telly, and you have tins of pork lunch and meat and tri triple wrapped loaves and all sorts of stuff. Nothing at all that's fresh or anything of that kind. This is the best, apparently, we can do. Now, if I was a member of a conventional uh, political party, like the Tories, like the Labour, God knows what Labour thinks it's doing these days. I used to vote Labour, but, I mean, forget it. And like the Lib Dems, like UKIP, the, 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 the immediate response to the fact that there is a billion starving out of seven billion is that there must be a billion people too many in the world. And this is what sort of drives this whole idea that everything in the world is caused by all the troubles of the world stem from what's called overpopulation. Gross, gross misrepresentation of what the problem's about. If I was a conventional scientist of the kind who works for DEFRA, of the kind who works for government, of the kind who works for Monsanto, or indeed like Sir John Bennington, who in 2011 produced a report called The Future of Food and Farming, you would make the point that, um, and he made the point, that we're, we're failing to feed all the people in the world, all the people in Britain, because we're not producing enough food. And in that report, John Bennington said, we will need to produce 
percent more food by 2050. Firstly, to increase rising numbers. Secondly, to meet what they call rising demands. And this again is complete, complete nonsense. The solution that they come up with, or the, the method by which they recommend that we should produce 50 percent more food, is of course high tech, and the flavour of the month is of course GMOs. So. We're all going to starve unless we have GMOs. We need Syngenta, we need Monsanto because otherwise, you know, what on earth is going to happen to us? And anyone who, 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 who protests is obviously irresponsible, some, well, some idiot greedy, frankly, so, or some idiot lefty. That is the standard solution that you get from scientists, at least of the kind who actually want to be employed. If I was a conventional economist, of the kind who wants to be employed, I will say, well, obviously the reason that so many people are hungry is that they don't have enough money. And I remember actually Bob Gildoff a few years ago when he was doing his stuff in Africa and he was made a sir and people were saying, should he be canonized and all that stuff, and he went to Niger and then he had a chat with George W. Bush and he said, ah, George W. Bush has got it right. If the people, he said, I can't do his accent, but I'll try it. No, no. If the, if the people of Niger, no, never mind. If the people of Niger had money, they wouldn't need to grow food, is what he said. And you think, what a grotesque misrepresentation of, of what the whole problem is about. And you realise, incidentally, in passing, how fragile these sort of these people tend to be. I do remember also in this context, Mrs. Thatcher. Oh, how many years ago is that now? Twenty something something. She was giving a sermon to the Church of Scotland. I don't know whether it's the elders of the Church of Scotland whatever they called the Church of Scotland, but there they all were, all these clerics with their vestments. And she stood up in a church in Edinburgh and said, and told them what the, what the moral of the Good Samaritan parable was. And she said, the, the moral of it is that you can't actually do good unless you're wealthy. Because the Good Samaritan was able to direct his servant to help the chat who had been beaten up. And if he hadn't been wealthy, he wouldn't have been able to do that because he wouldn't have had a servant. So, you know, moral, you've got to get rich first. Now, the elders of the Church of Scotland looked due to be appalled. I mean, nobody could believe that she had said such a thing, but she clearly did. And in a, her strange way, she was a kind of a moralist. But she had a very strange idea of how you sort of get things right. And if I was a member of uh, the, est the establishment of any kind, and of the kind who attends the Oxford Farming Conference, which David alluded to, I would say, well, if we want to bring down the price of food, which is what we are, ostensibly talking about, then we need to increase farm efficiency. And this is the great watchword in the NFU and all the people, top people in farming is this word efficiency. What they mean by it is cash efficiency. How much cash do you spend? How much do you get back? They're not talking about biological efficiency, not talking about the efficiency of the energy you put in, the energy you get back, not talking about any, any, anything to do with human happiness or human well-being, any of those things or well-being of the environment, they're talking only about cash. And what they point out is that the, one of the most expensive inputs in a, in, a, in a traditional farm is the cost of the labour. So they say if you want to increase the efficiency, you've got to cut the costs, so you've got to cut the labour. And what we've had for the last 50 years is a frenetic, uh, uh, what's the word, drive to reduce farm labour. And that is said to increase the efficiency of the people who are left, because each of the people who are left are actually producing far more per head than they were before. What you actually do, of course, is you replace human skill with industrial chemistry, and you replace it and with big machinery, and you do it on the largest possible scale because that way you get the, you know machines are most efficient when they're big, and etc. etc. So long as oil remains relatively cheap, and so long as the farming remains very, very, very simple, you can get away with that, and you can say, yes, it's more, it's cheaper to do it this way, than it's cash efficiency. But the effect on the world at large is an absolute disaster. The corporates are telling us this, we need this cash efficiency, and the way you achieve it is by industrial chemistry, high tech, and all that kind of stuff. And governments, I'm afraid, these days and for the last 50 years, have seen themselves as extensions of the corporate boardroom. And when they talk about being responsible, they mean doing things that are good for the city. And it isn't just a conservative thing. I mean, Gordon Brown was saying it, not Gordon Brown. David Cameron was saying it last week in the context of the Ukraine. We've got to support the Ukraine because otherwise it's bad for the city. 
never mind what's good for the people or etc. etc. It's bad for the city. And but Gordon Brown used to say exactly the same thing 30, 20 years ago. We've got to do things for good for the city. So it's all about encouraging uh, corporates basically to do their thing. And what we now have ruling the country and ruling the world is in fact a coalition. It's not a coalition of Lib Dems and Tories, which doesn't really mean anything. It's a coalition of governments of all parties, with the exception, I hope, of this one, with corporates. And the very sad thing is that academ academe, the academics themselves, including scientists and economists, if they want a job, go along with this. And they become part of the coalition, they become part of the oligarchy. And I read science. I mean, science was my thing. I started 60 years ago reading chemistry and stuff like that. And the whole ethos then was that science was about finding out the truth. And insofar as you used it for the, for, for applied it, you applied it for the benefit of humankind. So it was either a sort of a serious search for truth or it was a public service. And actually in my day, if you were an academic, and you've got a job with a, on the side with a corporate, a big commercial company, you were expected to leave academia because that very obviously compromised your, your, your purity. Nowadays, it's the exact opposite. Unless you have a job with a corporate, they're not going to get employed at all because the universities don't have any money of their own. Everything has been handed over to the corporates. Now, all of this is um, the whole analysis that we need to cut down on labor, uh, on we need to cut the population, that we need to increase the food supply, that we need to increase efficiency by sacking people, etc. All of it is entirely untrue. It's a false analysis. And I'm inclined to quote one of my favourite quotes. It's from Aldous Huxley. And he wrote to his brother, Julian, in 1914, a letter about the British government's treaty with Italy as it happened. And the quote is, it really makes one gasp one wonders which is the greatest, the stupidity or the wickedness of our rulers. I think it's their stupidity. Well, I don't know. It might be their stupidity, it might be their wickedness, but it implies absolutely to what we see in present government and particularly as applied to agriculture. <laughs> the point, first of all, is that there are three points I want to make at this point. The first is that the, all the individual components of the standard analysis <clears throat> the, the analysis that dominates our lives about what's wrong with the world are flawed, are false. We don't need to produce 50% more food by 2050. And people are not hungry <clears throat> because there are too many people. And there's very good analyses from people who do know something about food to the effect that the world now produces enough food for 14 billion people, which is twice the present world population. And since the UN tells us that human numbers are stabilizing and will stabilize at about nine and a half billion by 2050, this means we already produce about 50% more food than we will ever need. And this business that we need 50% more, <coughs> well, that's, that, that's, that's the first point, sorry. The second point relative, relevant to this is that people like Bennington say, Yes, but it's not just a question of rising numbers, it's also a question of rising aspirations. And they say, <coughs> excuse me, there is, in particular, there is a rising demand for meat, and meat is kind of profligate, it needs more resource to produce than grain, and so on and so on. So the rising demand for meat plus the rising population means we get up to 50%. This business that people have a tremendous demand for meat or a requirement for meat is, of course, complete nonsense. I mean, I'm not a vegan, I'm not a vegetarian, I don't know how many people are here are they vegans or vegetarians, but it can't be more than two, to my knowledge, uh, yeah. from there. But um, <coughs> um, we can just discuss it later because it's important and interesting. But the point is, what was I losing the thread now? The idea that people demand meat, I think, is actually ridiculous. If you look at the history of meat eating since the Second World War, you find it has been promoted more than anything else. It's been promoted. And it's been promoted for all kinds of reasons in the, in the immediate post-war years. And I remember the world, as I'm not old. <clears throat> we were told that you had to eat loads and loads and loads of protein. That was the law, L-O-R-E, from, from the 1930s. And um, we were told you had to eat so much protein you couldn't possibly get it unless you got it from meat. 
So we were being show, told that meat is the thing. And then, of course, the main thing about meat is entirely commercial. Because at the moment, as you am sure you know, meat is largely fed on grain. Now, the reason it's largely fed on grain is not that it, most animals need grain, but that actually what you want to do if you're a farmer or if you're the agricultural industry as a whole is remove the ceiling on production. And the trouble is if you have a, a vegetarian diet or a vegan diet, or indeed if you have a traditional diet, it's actually too easy to feed people. Traditional diets, as well as vegetarian and vegan diets, are very highly grain-based. And it's very easy to produce enough to support a traditional diet or, of course, to produce a vegan diet. If you produce too much, then, of course, there's a ceiling on the production and you, can't, you don't maximise your return. And as Jack Cohen, who was the founder of Tesco, said about 100 years ago, you've got to pile them high if you want to make lots of money. If you... So the way to get rid of your grain surpluses Produce, so you can produce more and more and more, is to feed it to livestock. If you, can't feed, if you can't find enough livestock to feed it to, these days you burn it and you call it biofuel. But the whole point, this thrust to produce more and more and more, is entirely to do with reducing market ceilings. Now demand for meat is judged retrospectively. First of all, these, these super sales people set out to sell as much meat as they can, and then when they've sold it, they say, well, there must have been a demand or we wouldn't have sold it. I mean, it's, you know, fridges to Eskimos, kind of sand to Arabs, it's that kind of argument. That's how they judge how much is needed. What you want is some critical thought to say, well, how much meat should we really be producing? And if you wanted to be a vegan, if you, wanted, if you were strictly talking about human physiology, what could we get away with? You would indeed say, well, we don't really need to produce any at all, so you'd say zero. If you were talking about supporting traditional cuisines, you'd say, well, not very much, actually, because if you look at all the great traditional cuisines, India, China, um, Turkey, Lib uh, Lebanon, or even Western Europe, North Britain, France, anywhere, you find that, that actually meat is used very, very sparingly. So we don't actually need to produce much to support the great cuisines. And if we were to ask the question, how much meat do we really need to produce in order to support the great cuisines, the answer would be not much. And it would be not talking austerity, we're talking about what do we need for the best possible cooking. But they don't ask that question, they say how much can we possibly sell? And then they set out to sell it. And then when they've sold a great pile of it, they say there must have been a demand, otherwise we wouldn't have sold it. You see, it's gross. And this idea that we need 50% more food is based on that kind of thinking. And it's perpetrated by scientists who are supposed to be critical thinkers. And what strikes me when, when scientists get stuck in to agricultural policy and when they start working for governments instead of thinking, they, they leave their brains, you know, they leave their critical faculties at home. They don't apply it. So, the first point is that the basic analysis based on the idea that we need more food and all that kind of stuff is completely flawed. It's also flawed to suggest that we, oh, I've already told you, put about population. The second point that we really need is what we need above all is not more and more food in order to solve the world's food problems or more and more money, what, because we've already got loads in this country, certainly. What we actually need is social justice. And you need an economy that gives you social justice so that actually nobody is poor. And there's absolutely no reason why anybody in this country should be poor, because we are actually a very, very rich country. But we have an economy which is designed, the neoliberal economy, the so-called free market, which in fact is run as a series of cartels by the big corporates. But we have an economy which is designed, intended to be maximally competitive. No cooperation, maximally competitive. And the point about a competitive economy is that you do indeed get some winners and in the present economy, you see winners all over the place. There's a growing market of Chinese billionaires. Owen Patterson, incidentally, said that British farmers should set out to produce beef to sell to Chinese billionaires. That's his idea. He said that at the Oxford Farming Conference in 2013. That is, uh, is, his, you know, that is his agricultural strategy. Anyway, the point is you do get a few million uh, winners, very, very, very rich people, commonly known as fat cats. But you get losers, that's the whole point of a competition, you get the losers. And the billion who are starving in the world as a whole are the losers, the inevitable result of a competitive economy which is designed to produce losers. And the same is true for the people in this country who have to go to food banks in order to get anything to eat. 
Another problem, which I think is huge, is that um, modern governments, for the last 30, 40 years, 50, 60 years ago they didn't say this kind of thing, but for the last 30, 40 years they have paid lip service to the idea of what they call the environment. Only lip service. You only fiddle about with the environment when you're very, very rich, basically. And, 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 you know. But the point is that the word environment, in my opinion, which I'm, I'm, this, is, this is especially for breed greens, should be banned. It's a terrible, terrible word. What it means, literally, is surroundings. In other words, it's an entirely anthropocentric concept. It means, in effect, it tends to mean stage scenery, or it means um, real estate. And George W. Bush, his father, the other George Bush, used to talk about the environment. What they meant was real estate. And when they talked about green, what they meant was golf courses. Or they meant a place where you can go and shoot things and throw a big chat you are. I mean, it's just grotesque. The word we ought to be employing, and I recommend this to the Greens, is biosphere, which was coined by Taiwan Ashada about 100 years ago. Jesuit priest was also a very good biologist. And obviously what it means, you know, the whole, the whole living world. And I like the idea of Gaia, and as, as promoted by, um, or as devised, as thought up by uh, James Lovelock. And the biosphere you know, is a kind of neutral term which says it's all out there. Gaia says that all the, that the biosphere is, as the expression is, homeostatic. In other words, it creates the conditions in which itself, it itself can flourish. In other words, it behaves like a living organism. And uh, the reason James Lovelock it didn't coin the expression, William Golding coined the expression because he was a chum of Lovelock, so, but Lovelock adopted it. And the point is, of course, that Gaia is the Greek goddess of the earth. And he said that the whole Earth, in fact the whole cosmos, not the whole solar system, should be conceived as a kind of meta-organism, which keeps itself intact. Anthropo uh, environment is an entirely anthropocentric concept, but the biosphere is not an anthropocentric concept. What the biosphere says, and the whole idea of bio says, is that the rest of the world is not there for our convenience to look after and, 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 and sorry, to make use of and so on and so on. It is, we are part of the great living organism which is the earth and we should treat it like that and, and um, otherwise well, there are two things A we should treat it the biosphere as if we genuinely were part of it as if other creatures were as Francis says brothers and sisters partly because that is the good and the right thing to do but partly because it's the necessary thing to do because if we wreck the biosphere as we were doing wonderfully at this moment we are going to go down, down the tubes as well. In other words, and it seems to me that we're not going to look after the biosphere unless we have this attitude of reverence towards it, unless we think of ourselves as being part of it. And that is not simply a kind of airy-fairy sentimental thing to do as it happens. It is also the only thing that we, what we need to do if we are serious about our own future on this world. It is a shocking thing that, for example, now the only people who defend the environment, so-called as they like to call it, tend to do so on the grounds that, that, that it provides us with eco-services. Again, it's this anthropocentric view that it's there for our benefit and is to combine with the idea that in, unless it pays its way, we shouldn't bother with it. If you have this attitude, you more or less sign this death warrant, and if you sign this death warrant, you sign our death warrant too. So, drop environment, talk about the biosphere. I have another little line here. When people, it, it, about half the species in the world now, it is conservatively estimated, are in danger of extinction. That's about four million species out of eight million. Immediate danger of extinction, probably gone by the end of the century. You, 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 it's not, every week, you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of species disappear. And, and they're disappearing in this country, hand over fist. I think two bumblebee species have disappeared in the last 20 years, something like that. And we've lost a lot of butterflies, nobody really knows how many. The ones we've been hearing about, of course, are the honeybees. The reason we've been hearing about those is that they are commercially significant. I mean, that's why it's attracted so much importance and attention. And, of course, honeybees, though, are just a sign of what's happening to everything else. I mean, I like to ask people, when did you last see a fly? And I remember when you couldn't put, you couldn't put anything out on the table without 
a million flies descending on it. Well, now you can leave things out all day, and you won't see a fly. Uh, I, I live in Oxford, not obviously, not 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 term. You know, they've got basically, and, so, and uh, my line here, which I do like, of course, you all know from John Donne: "Ask not for whom the bell tolls; it tolls for thee." And then when you see scientists, one of, one of the ideas of people are asking why are these bees becoming extinct and one of the obvious things is it, it must be in part due to this great weight of insecticides that are spreading everywhere and in particular the neonicotinoids known as the neonics. I've been to conferences actually organised by my wife Ruth at the Houses of Parliament, the all party parliamentary group on agroecology, <clears throat> where the evidence that, that neonics are killing bees is, is sort of cast iron. And yet scientists who work for the government and the, the corporates, basically the same thing, queue up to, to, to discredit the evidence which very clearly shows that the neonicotinoids are in fact killing off the bees. It's quite a disgrace. And they use kind of very spurious philosoph uh, philosophy of science, very spurious, in order to make that point. They say there's no proof that neonics kill bees. But of course there is there's no proof, if anything, in, in, the, in the real world. There's only proof of geometrical theorems. You can't prove that kind of thing. What you can show is the balance of probability is what the bayonets are killing them off. But that's, in this context, apparently not enough for the scientists. It's, it's, it's just, as they say, I think, corrupt. So my first criticism of what all, all the parties have been saying about food and about the environment and uh, the biosphere and about farming over the last 50 years is the analyses are quite simply wrong. And the second thing that's wrong with their, uh, whole, uh, their whole analysis of what's going on and their whole, the solutions they bring to bear is that it is incoherent. And this is where I want my slide, if that's possible to be in. This is my contribution to world thinking. It's not actually, it's not actually a world first, because I've <coughs> Before, but this this is everything that's wrong with the world, and everything that needs to be done, <coughs> summarised in one simple diagram. And I divide this. And at the top, you see, it's eight balloons. At the top, it says convivial society in a secure and, bias, and um, diverse biosphere. <coughs> secure and diverse should be flourishing. I'm going to change this. Anyway, the point is, the top two balloons, one inside the other spells out what it is we should be trying to achieve. And I'm saying we should be trying to achieve convivial societies, societies in which we all actually want to live and can live. But convivial societies cannot survive and are not really convivial unless the world as a whole is healthy. That's why you need a flourishing biosphere. Now, two points of difference between this and what the conventional parties say. One is that the conventional parties wouldn't say that at all. But the second is that these days they don't even spell out what they are actually trying to achieve at all. The government blunder on and the Labour Party blunders on without ever stating what it's trying to achieve. I think that's quite astonishing. The only thing you get from Cameron is we need, and Osborne and all the rest of them, is that we need economic growth, more and more and more wealth. And that was all actually you really got from, from Blair and Brown, although they were supposed to be socialists, they were supposed to have social ideals. And it's all you're now getting from Miliband. It, it is, but at least say what you're trying to do, and that's what we're trying to do. Now, <clears throat> the second balloon down in green, as you see, is enlightened agriculture. And enlightened agriculture is agriculture that is actually designed to provide good food for people without wrecking the rest of the world. Now, you might say, well, it's obvious that's what agriculture does. Well, no, it doesn't, not in the modern world. Agriculture these days is seen as the quote, as a, as a business like any other. And business has been redefined as a means of making as much money as possible. So the, the drive behind modern agriculture is to make as much money as possible. And the things you need to do to maximize wealth in agriculture are the exact opposite of what you need to do if you're simply trying to produce enough food to feed everybody without wrecking the rest of the world. <coughs> and very, very briefly, the method of agri enlightened agriculture is agroecology. Agroecology treats each farm as an ecosystem and the farming as a whole as a very serious part of the biosphere. 
If you just look at the basic biology, you see that what you need to have agriculture that is productive, but is also sustainable and is also resilient, is it needs above all to be diverse. So you need mixed farming and you need heterogeneous, heterogeneity within the crops and within the, within the animals. It's got to be diverse, first of all. It's got to be low input. Can't go whacking on the pesticides and the oil and all the rest of it. They're all oil-based. Obvious. That basically means organic. If they're uh, diverse and they're um, uh, b -b 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 organic, that means they're also going to be very, very complicated. If they're complicated, you have to have lots of skill on board. They have to be skills intensive. It doesn't mean lots of coolies, lots of slaves. It means lots of skilled farmers, lots of skilled smallholders. If you've got all those three conditions, labor intensive, etc., or skills intensive, diverse, etc., there is no real advantage in scale-up. So the default size, average size of, of, of the farms that we really need, enlightened farms, will be small to medium sized. If you look at this country, we've now got only 1% of people working on the land because of the idea that you've got to get rid of people to save money. We've got, uh, what we probably need near a 10%. I, I reckon as, as, as a first estimate, we probably need about a million new farmers now. And they should be young. I mean, the average age of a farm owner these days is, 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 is sort of 70, 60 plus. We need a new generation, we need a whole lot of them, we need them fast, and we need probably about 10% of people, young kids coming in, who are getting jobs, looking into farming. Incidentally, we would, incidentally, overnight, if we did this, solve the uh, problem of unemployment and underemployment. Because, you know, the million that we need is roughly equivalent to the number who until very recently of under 25s who were under unemployed. And now they're not unemployed, but they are stacking shelves in Tesco's and working in call centers and stuff, which are not real jobs. But if we reintroduced agriculture as a proper job, then we start to, A, we get a decent agriculture, and B, we start to make a serious impact on, on, on unemployment and re-establish the balance of time in the country and so on. Worldwide, something like two billion people work on the land. If the people, if the people worldwide followed the industrial model of agriculture that we have, they would throw most of those two billion out of work. And that is the royal road to poverty. And the same governments that have been going around saying we've got to have war and poverty and all that kind of stuff, haven't said it recently because their own economies have collapsed, but they were saying. The same governments that have been saying that are also encouraging forms of agriculture which create poverty on a grand scale. And just another little statistic from the United Nations. About a billion people are now estimated to live in urban slums worldwide. Since about half the people in the world live in cities these days, that means about three and a half billion live in cities. That means that nearly one third of all the people who live in cities live in slums. And yet all the policies of the world are designed to drive people off the land and into the cities, and that's considered to be the smart thing to do, etc., etc. The trouble with enlightened agriculture, the small mixed farm, etc., etc., is that it is the total opposite of what we now have, which is huge monocultural factory farms, all that stuff, zero labour if you can achieve it, very high capital, very high input, the total opposite. But the present day industrial agriculture finds it very easy to survive within the present uh, economic climate and with the present kind of government, because that's exactly what they want. Top down, big money, etc. And enlightened agriculture, if it's going to survive at all, we have to think in terms of a new kind of economy and new kinds of politics. The economy that one recommends, actually, is basically, it's very simple, there's nothing frightening about it. We're not talking about Stalinism, we're just talking actually about the good old-fashioned social democracy mixed economy. And we're also talking about um, the absolute importance of community ownership. And uh, one of the things we're pushing is the whole idea of the village farm, for example, and CSAs, Community Supported Agriculture. We're running a group called uh, funding enlightened agriculture, where the whole idea is for people to put money into enterprises, farms and other things, which are in line with enlightened agriculture, using primarily the methods of um, ethical investment. Basically, it's you know, standard financial mechanisms, but used for social ends. In other words, you can see all farms and endowed businesses, really, as social enterprises. They make money, but they also serve a, uh, primarily they serve a social purpose or, or, or a biospheric purpose. 
if you want to talk directly about the price of food, the main reason that food seems so expensive these days is actually because of the price of housing. Because we spend about 13% or 14%, I think it now is, of our income on food on average. But families commonly now spend 50% of their income on houses, which is ludicrous. Most of that goes straight to banks. Most of that has to do with house prices. Very little of that has to do with the price of building a house. So what we should be doing, so that means that the 13 or 14% of the money that we spend on food is actually um, something like 26, 27% of the disposable income because 50% is already gone. So food is actually now quite dear, but although it's cheap compared with the whole, but it's dear compared with what we actually have to dispense, dispose of. But also, also, when conventional governments say we've got to reduce the price of food, as I say, they, they, they attack food production itself. And they say you've got to get rid of more labour and make the food farming bigger and more efficient. In fact, if you analyse it, it's probable that the labour accounts for only about 10% of the cost, of the total cost of the food. 60% or 66%, two thirds of what we spend on food in a supermarket, not, I might say, self-righteously, that Ruth and I have a go to supermarkets, but 60% or so of what people spend on food goes to the food chain. It goes to the supermarket itself, it goes to the banks who are lending all the money, and it goes to the carriers and so on and so on. The farmer gets only about a third of the retail price. If, if you had a conventional, I mean an old-fashioned traditional marketing system, you know, ordinary small shops, local deliveries, they would get about 60%. In other words, they'd get twice what they get now, twice the present income, income for, for, the, for the present output. And if you add in things like community ownership and all that kind of stuff and bring uh, community ownership of land and so on and so on, you can bring that down still further. So the farmer gets the same kind of money for producing, well actually producing far less food but to a far higher standard. And without increasing the price of food you hugely increase the quality and you make it much more available because it's local etc. etc. But if you want to reduce the price of food it's not a question of attacking the cost of food, it's a question of creating an economy in which the farmer gets a decent cut and that means in particular <coughs> reducing the price uh, of housing which is key, which is critical. So again, the title of my little talk, if you want to bring down the price of food, don't talk about the price of food, talk about the price of everything else in the context. The same with the politics, at the moment as we all know we have this terrible oligarchy, it's supposed to be a democracy, people go to war to fight for what they call democracy, they're actually fighting as we all know for this oligarchy, this corporate government academic um, coalition. We need politics, I mean as, what's this called, Abraham Lincoln said that it's of, of, the, fam, of, of, the, of the people and for the people. Not that difficult to organise, not that frightening. The opposite. I just like to say, although I'm not going to talk about it here, that everything, all these things, the politics and the economics and so on, are rooted, well, in morality. The question is, what do you actually think is good in this world? What do you try to do? <clears throat> and I like to argue as the core moral recommendations of all the great religions are threefold. First of all, that you need compassion. Secondly, you need humility. And thirdly, that you should treat the world as a whole, the biosphere as a whole with uh, reverence. That's the core. Completely gone missing from uh, anything that. I mean, the, the, uh, the present neoliberal economy is the opposite of compassion. Science should be seen as you know, a fundamental thing that produces great ideas and then feeds in when it's necessary. Now, it, is, um, it does what the corporates tell it to do. And when I, I used to work for Farmers Weekly briefly in the early 70s, and then in the early 70s, Britain had a wonderful network of about 30 what were called agriculture and food research councils, uh, institutions, Rothamsted, Rowett, John Innes, etc., etc., which were all independent. And they, what they did was decided by the directors and the boards of each, uh, uh, what do you call it, institution. Now, under Thatcher, basically under Keith Joseph, these were either closed or they were privatised. Now, the policy is decided entirely by, by the corporates that own them, that run them. They deny this, but it is true. And, uh, well, we've lost independent science. But if we want science that really works, or morality that really works, then I like to see them as a branch of what one calls, I like to call, other people like to call, metaphysics, 
i.e. you're asking fundamental questions like, you know, why are we here and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, conclusion. Right, I've said the conclusions all the way through, the whole thing's been about conclusions. The conclusion is that we want to, if you really want cheap food, no, not cheap food, if we really want a world that works, and if we really want as a part of that food that people could actually afford, <clears throat> then we have to rethink the whole thing. And we have to think right from the beginning, thinking not just about us, but about the whole biosphere. We have to think about what we're trying to do, we have to think about morality, and so on and so on and so on. Now then, you might say, when you have to put social justice right at the top of your agenda, you have to put agroecology right at the top of your agenda. What has this got to do with the Green Party, some people might say. Now, I don't, there are Green Party members here, of course, I think probably most people. But it may well be that there are people in the higher echelon of the Green Party or even in the lower echelon of the Green Party who will say this doesn't actually have much to do with the Green Party manifesto. To be perfectly honest, I don't know whether it does or not. All I know is that it should. This is what it ought to be about. And uh, we do lose slightly you know Caroline Lucas, who I regard and we regard as one of the very, very few members of the House of Commons that one should actually it actually takes one should actually take seriously, and who actually makes the House of Commons look like something worth having. So it seems to me that this kind of thinking is very much in line with green thinking. It also seems to me that if one is going to vote at all, then the only party that wants, that's got any real chance of putting into practice any policies that are genuinely going to be good for the world is the Green Party. So that's my plug for the Green Party, and that's my plug for me getting on the Oxford Council, and I know there are enough people here to sway the vote. <laughs> 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 <laughs>